As this is a virtual session, please feel free to reach out on Discord or on GitHub with my usernames down below if you have any further questions after this. So diving right into it, one of the tools we've been recently working on is getting Twister working with our builds. Twister provides great benefits during development via incremental builds, rerunning failed tests, and parallelism. On the CI side, Twister allows for fast integration testing for some subset of platforms while running all of the test configurations on longer running, usually nightly builds. Now, time savings aren't just limited to debugging or runtime. At Google, we have a small math library, for example, which supports both fixed and floating point. We use a type def for them in order to keep the logic the same. In this example, you can see this right here. We use the same test logic, the same sources. Uh, and then once we enable it with the FPU and once without, this allows us to write the tests once but execute two different code paths. What this really leads to is test-driven developments. We're able to build the APIs, add the tests, and set a twister flag for the test cases to build only, which will make sure that we don't break our APIs that we've agreed on, uh, therefore no regression. And then we dive into the implementation, at which point we start enabling the tests to run one by one. So in this here, you have an example of another utility. This is the generated HTML test report. While it's not fully flushed out, you can see some clear benefits when a test fails. For one, it's possible to see only the logs relevant to the test right here. And you no longer have to look through thousands of lines of logging. Each suite also has properties above right here, which tell us the architecture and the platform. Other properties might be added later on, but for now, this allows us to narrow down the issue and possibly pinpoint some troublesome configurations. The test suite is really the container of all the unit tests. It starts out with a predicate, which we'll cover more details in, on later. But the predicate controls whether or not the suite will run. It's used for more complex tests where it might be impossible or too costly to configure every test suite individually. If the predicate returned true, we'll run the setup function of the test suite right here. The function may return a pointer to the suite's fixture. The fixture can be either statically or dynamically allocated. The test framework doesn't care. You'll get a chance to delete the dynamically allocated fixture later in the teardown function. We then iterate through all the unit tests. For each test, we'll run a before function right here. Then we'll actually run the test followed by the after function. If the test fails and fast fail is enabled, we'll bail from the executable. Otherwise, we'll continue running all of the unit tests in the suite. Once they've all run, we'll run the suite's teardown function and determine whether the suite passed or failed. So when do we want to use predicates? Well, in this example here, we have uh, my suite, which is a test suite that only wants to run when the count is two. To do this, we create a predicate that checks the uh, state by casting it to test state and then verifies that count is equal to two. This is the only condition in which this predicate will return true. The custom test main then iterates from zero to 10 and then tries to run all the test suite each time. At the very end, we call ztest verify all test suites ran. This function will make sure that every suite in this binary ran at least once. For modular design here, the unit tests themselves have four different options. The first and the simplest one just runs test zero when my suite is run. Test one will also run whenever my suite is run, but it will run in user mode when user space is enabled through kconfig. 
the underscore F suffix simply tells ZTest that the test needs the suite's fixture, the one returned by the setup function. The fixture name must be the suite's name with an underscore fixture suffix. The fixture is exposed as this, just like GTest's uh, class would scope the function to the fixture's class. At Google, we've also been exploring the addition of assume and expect APIs in addition uh, afterwards to adding to the assert APIs that already exist in Zephyr upstream. The assume API allows us to have calls to other functions without explicitly testing them, but requiring them in order to run our, the rest of our test. In this case, if an error is found in configure component, but another test is written to properly test the function, we don't want to fail both tests if this function fails. Instead, the assume API will simply mark test fn here as skipped and will allow the other actual test for configure component to show the failure. The expect API is more akin to the assert API, but allows the execution to continue. Only at the end of the function will the result be computed. That means that if get component value zero does not return five, we will continue executing, but the test might will still fail at the end of the function. The top level beauty of all of this comes with the modularity that the system provides. In the example here, we've declared a test suite in mytestsuite.c. Then, feature tests for option 1.c, right here, will contain tests assigned to mytestsuite, but require config option 1 name. This way, we can use kconfig to control whether or not these specific tests will bind to this test suite. Similarly, tests for I squared C zero right here require the I squared C path. This way, we can also depend on device tree configurations whether or not we want to include these specific tests. This means that it's possible to create a Zephyr library of tests that can be attached to multiple different test binaries and the library will only include the relevant tests. Test rules were brought in from JUnit 4 but more closely resemble the API in JUnit 5. They are similar to the suites before and after function but will run for every single test regardless of the suite. They can provide benefits such as resetting emulators for every test verifying some state, such as no errors were logged to the logging backend, or even resetting FFF mocks. FFF is natively supported in Zephyr without any kconfigs. It's a mocking framework that allows you to configure the return value, verify arguments passed, verify the number of calls to the mock, or even set a custom handler in case some side effect of the function are needed. This example shows how, when combined with C++'s lambdas, this feature can be even more powerful. Instead of simply replacing a weak function, we create a mock. The mock can be assigned a custom fake inside the test function. The custom fake lambda is scoped inside the function, meaning it's much easier to read. It's also possible to use capture groups to pass the fixture into the lambda, giving access to everything within the test to the function without having to pass any custom arguments or setting global state. Now getting to emulators, the normal control flow will have the driver call the bus driver right here, which will in turn communicate with the hardware. Instead, when emulation is enabled, the fake bus driver will take over and route the request to the emulated peripheral instead of the hardware. The, pen of the benefit is that the full application logic down to the device driver right here is executed. Normally, the application will enable the bus and the device driver. Similarly, the board's device tree will configure the bus right here and add the peripherals. In this example, it's done with an include statement, but it doesn't have to be. When running tests, 
for the same board, the kconfig uh, overlay simply needs to add the emulation framework, then add both the bus and the peripheral emulation. Since the emulator and the device driver both use the sample compatible string, the I2C peripherals, DTSI, right here, doesn't need to change. The only bus, uh, only the bus itself needs to be reconfigured or replaced for the test. That means that since the peripherals use the same compatible string and we're using the exact same include here, both this device driver and the emulator will create both the emulator and the device off of the same node in the device tree. So the actual definition for the emulator here should be look very similar to devices. Emule, uh, right here, emule dt inst define takes an index for the driver, just like device dt inst define takes an init function, configuration and data pointers, but and this is the new one, takes a bus API pointer. This API is the implementation of the hardware communication. This is the entry point where the emulator will respond to various bus reads and writes. In this example, you can see that we're using an I2C, and this is also conditioned off being not on the SPI bus, and will only be printing things. Uh, telling us what exactly was being transferred or read from the emulated peripheral. Touching on reliability, we found that it's often hard to write proper tests after functions that clean up the full state of the test. This is especially true in integration tests. This is why shuffling the test and suite order is key. When using POSIX, it's possible to pass the seed for the shuffle via twister, as well as see the value if an error takes place. This is very useful for replicating a failure, needing only the seed and the SHA of the commit. When used, each test suite will be shuffled and the tests internally to the suite will also be shuffled. This helps reduce the chances of test order dependencies. Finally, we're also in the process of adding a feature that will allow developers to rerun specific tests from the command line. Here, you can see running specific tests in suites, such as test one in suite A, test two in suite A, and all of the tests in suite B. It is important to notice that uh, this is a feature that is only available in POSIX. Thank you very much. And please remember if you have any questions, or issues with this, please file a bug and assign it to us. Thank you. Have a great day.